welcome to our discussion on principles of economics once again. In the last couple of sessions, we were discussing the important principles that will be guiding us throughout this course. Today, what we will do, we will learn how to think like an economist. So, that means, uh, economists, they basically think in their own way by making certain assumptions about the reality, by making simple economic models. And economic analysis is also like a scientific analysis. That is why economics is also called as social science. The moment I say economics is also a science, that means a natural question that comes to our mind is why do we call economics is also a science? What is the similarity between a scientific analysis and an economic analysis? So, basically economists, they play two major roles. As scientists, they try to explain the world and as policy advisors, they try to improve it. So, firstly, economists will explain why certain things are happening in certain particular ways and then they will also suggest policies so as to improve the situations, right. Now, if I ask you what is science, can you tell me what is science or what are the major features of a scientific analysis? For any scientific analysis, it starts with observations. You have to observe things, right? For example, if you uh, recall uh, the way Newton, the famous scientist Newton, he came up with his idea of gravitational forces. So, he observed why apples are falling down, why it is not going up from the trees. So, he was observing this for many days and after observations, what we require is actually you need to collect data and then you need to analyze and then at the end, you will come up with certain theories that will basically explain why all the fruits, they fall down, they do not go up and that is how you came up with the theory of gravitational forces. Same thing is applicable in the context of economics as well. Economists will also observe things, particularly social behaviors. For example, if you think about how the theory of consumption function proposed by John Maynard Keynes, it came into the, uh, 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 it came into the literature. Basically, he was observing how people are behaving in the context of their consumption. So, that means when they have income, how much proportion of the income they spend, how much they save and that is how they came up with theories of consumption function, which is known as Keynesian consumption function, right. So, it start with, starts with observation, collecting data, analyzing and then at the end of the day, you have to come up with some theories that will basically explain people's consumption behavior for this particular example. So, economists employ scientific methods as I told you already and dispassionate development and testing the theories about how the world works. So, either you have to test the theory or you have to develop your own theory that is called a scientific analysis. Then we make assumptions, okay. In analyzing a situation, economists they will assume certain things. These assumptions are basically meant for simplifying the complex world, which is easy to understand, right. For example, uh, when we study international trade, we will assume there are two countries and there are two goods. Now, you might be saying that in the world, there are too many countries. Why are you assuming only two, com two countries? There are too many goods in this world. Why are you assuming only two goods? The only purpose of this assumption is to make the world very simple. To start with, if I assume there are n number of countries and there are n number of goods, then it would be very difficult for us to understand. 
So, once we understand the economic theories based on these simplistic models, then we can always relax these assumptions and make our model towards more realistic. It is like when we go to a driving school, the uh, our trainer what they uh, tell us, at least it was my experience when I went to the driving school, my trainer asked me uh, to do A, B, C with the three uh, uh, pedals. A means accelerator, B means brake and C is the clutch. So, I was continuously doing A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. By A, I will be pressing the accelerator pedal, by B, I will be pressing the brake pedal and by uh, C, I will be pressing the clutch pedal. But that does not mean that when you actually drive on the road, you will do A, B, C, A, B, C and A, B, C. In fact, if you do so, you can easily understand what will be the consequence. Then the question is, why my trainer is telling me to do that? Because my trainer's objective is to make the world simple so that I can understand and get a feel of these three paddles. Once I am habituated with these three, once I know the real feel of these three paddles, then actually on the road I can do real driving. So, that is exactly the purpose of making assumptions and making simple models to make the world simple. So, these are unrealistic but simple to learn and gives useful insights about the real world. So, instead of asking the validity of this assumption, rather what we will see whether those assumptions can actually explain the world to a greater extent. Okay? So, learning out of that simplistic models whether they are applicable to certain extent to the real world or not that is the purpose. So, a model is a highly simplified representation of a more complicated reality. Okay? Economists they use models to study economic issues. Okay? For example, when we go to a uh, 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 when we, we, we studied biology, we used to use this type of uh, anatomy, that means human anatomy models. This looks exactly like a human's anatomy, but this is not a real. So, this was a, a model which used to, we used to use in our biology class. And once you know things with these models, you can understand the human anatomy also quite well. That was the purpose of the, using this type of uh, models. This is another model of airplane. This is a model of dentist okay, that they use in their clinic. When you go to a dentist, dentist will use this model and they will show you where exactly the problem lies. So, this is not the real teeth, but this is basically a model. So, which is easy to understand. Now, our first model that we are going to use is a circular flow diagram. Now, this circular flow diagram will help us understand how the economy actually works, how different economic agents are behaving, how income is flowing from one particular sector to another particular sector. This is called a circular flow diagram. Now, in this circular flow diagram, first of all, we need to think in any economy, there are basically two types of markets. Can you think about what are those two types of markets? All the markets we can classify into two broad categories. One is called input market, another one is called output market. Okay? Look at this. A visual model of the economy which shows how dollar or money flow from markets among households and firms. Two types of actors we are assuming households and firms. Okay? Households and firms. 
and there are two markets as I said the market for goods and services and market for factors of production. So, that means market for goods and services is called output market, markets for factors of production is called input market. So, you cannot think of any other market apart from these two. Market for output means any market you take, whether it is a market for uh, computer, whether it is a market for clothing, whether it is a market for electric fan, whether it is a market for pen drive, whatever, these are called market for goods and services. And market for factors of production is basically input market, where you go to buy your inputs for production. It can be labor market, it can be capital market, it can be material market, it can be energy market. So, basically all the inputs are available in input market and all the outputs are sold in the goods and services market. So, the factors of production are basically the resources that the economy uses to produce goods and services and that includes labor, land, capital, okay, labor, land, capital and this is how these are the two sectors, farm sector and household sector. Farm sector produces output and household sectors, they consume that output, okay. So, apart from these two, there is nothing else in an economy. Households mean you, me, everyone, we constitute the household and here is the form, they produce the goods and services. So, households basically they own the factors of production. That means, household will supply their labor or they will rent them to firms for income, right? And then they will buy or consume goods and services. So, household, what are the factors of production they supply? They can either supply labor, you, me, everyone is working to either some uh, organization or the other. Households also out of their income, they save money. That saving, they keep it in bank. And these firms, they go to the bank and then they borrow money from the bank, which they invest for their production. So, that means basically household is actually the supplier of capital also. So, if the firms, they require capital, of course, they are not going directly to the households, they are going to the financial intermediaries which is bank. So, you, me, all of us, we will keep our savings into bank and then banks will lend the money to the firms and that is how indirectly households are lending or renting their factors of production to the firms. Okay? And in return, Households will buy or consume goods and services produced by this farm sector. What the firms will do? The firms will hire the factors of production, use them for their uh, goods and services production and then they will sell the goods and services. That means if you now think what is the source of households income? Households will get either wages and salaries if they supply labor or they will get a rent or interest what they are lending to the firms. If I keep money to bank, I will get interest rate, right? At the same time, if I directly invest to the firm, right, by buying shares or stocks, then I will get dividend. Okay, from the firms. That way also I can earn money from the share market. Okay, so when you are buying share, basically firms are sharing a certain percentage of their profit to the household sector. That is the source of their income. What is the source of firms income? When household sector go to the output market, they buy goods and services, they spend money, and that money what they spend in the goods market or services market, that is the source of firm's income. Very easy to understand. So, this is markets for factors of production. 
Look at this what is happening. Households are supplying land, labor and capital in the factors of production market. Okay. This is the market of factors of production. They are either supplying labor or they are renting land or capital to the firms that they are using for production. And then, as I told you, firm will either give you wage if you supply labor, they will pay you rent for your capital or they will give you profit, a certain percentage of their profit if you directly invest in their stocks. So, when we invest in stock market, we get dividend which is basically a share of their profit coming from the stock market. That is the source of household's income. Then we have factors, sorry, we have markets for goods and services, household sector will go there and spend. That spending is basically is called as revenue which is the source of firm's income. So, that is how this circular flow works, right. So, in the market for goods and services, households are basically buyer and firms are seller. In the market for factors of production, households are seller, firms are buyer. So, this model, this simple model can easily understand how the economy actually works, right. So, that is the beauty of economic analysis. They will use very simplified model, but these models are very useful to understand the reality. Even though the real world is very complicated, this is nothing but the circular flow. That is how economic agents are making their decisions. Okay. Now, we will use another model, very important and useful model, which is called production possibilities frontier. Production possibilities frontier. From the name itself, it will give you some idea. Production possibilities frontier. Production possibilities means what are the different combination of goods and services that can be produced and the frontier means what is the maximum of these goods you can produce. Frontier means a boundary. Now, why we are thinking first of all what is the need of this model? Now, if you go back to our previous discussions, we said that the essence of economics starts from the fact that resources are limited. And there is unlimited demand. That means society has limited amount of resources for production. It can be labor, it can be capital, it can be land, anything. All the factors are actually available to a limited amount. But the society wants n number of goods and producers uh, to be produced, goods and services. So that means we cannot produce all the items. We cannot increase production of each and every goods and services. If we want to have more of certain goods or services, we must sacrifice the production of some other goods and services. If the economy wants to produce more gun to protect the economy, to protect the country, obviously less resources are available for production of manufacturing goods, production of agricultural products, so on and so forth. So, that means we can easily understand there is a trade off between let us say gun and butter. Then the question is we need to know what are the different combination of gun and butter or let us say computer and clothing or let us say mineral water and pen drive, different combination of these goods, how we are going to produce. So, economy now has to make a trade off, economy is has to take a decision which commodity to use more, which commodity to produce less using the limited amount of resources available. That is why there is a need to understand the concept of production possibilities frontier. 
So what is this? A graph that shows different combination of two goods the economy can possibly produce given the available resources and available technology. See here I, we are assuming only two goods to make the thing simple. Once we know the idea using two goods concept then we can easily relax that to extend this analysis to n number of goods context. Okay. So this production possibility that means we will show you different combination of two goods. We can take some example like computer and wheat. These are the let us say two goods that the economy wants to produce. And what is the resource available? Let us assume that it requires only one factor of production which is labor measured by hour, labor hour. So, it is a simplified model. Okay? There are only two goods, computers and wheat. There is only one factor of production. And let us also assume that the economy has 50,000 labor hours per month available. 50,000 labor hours every month. Now, look at this. Producing one computer, let us assume producing one computer require 100 hours of labor and producing one ton of wheat requires 10 hours of labor. Okay? So, these are the different combination of wheat and computer that the economy can produce using that 50,000 labor hour per month. So, if all the 50,000 labor hour is used only for making computers and no labor hour is spent for wheat production, how many computers that the economy will be producing? 50,000 divided by 100. So, that would be 500 and what would be the wheat production? That would be 0. That is exactly happening. Then let us assume we have uh, in, in situation B, 40,000 labor hour is spent for computer and 10,000 for wheat. Then how many computers you will get? 400. How many uh, wheat, uh, how many tons of wheat you will produce? 100. Sorry, 1000. Okay. Similarly, like this. <coughs> Now, if you look at this production structure, as the production of computers going down, production of wheat is increasing. So, you are basically substituting wheat for computer. Okay? I am increasing the production of wheat and I am reducing the production of computer. So, that means these are the different combination of computer and wheat that is producible for the economy when the labor hour is available for 50,000 hours per month. And these different combinations, if we add the locus of these points is basically the production possibility frontier. Okay? So, look at how the production possibility frontier is drawn. This is the way. When it is 50,000, that is 0. When it is 40,000, that is 1,000. When it is 250, that is this. So, these are the different combination. All right. And this is the production possibility frontier. So, this blue line indicates the production possibility frontier, which is nothing but. So, what is this production possibility frontier? You take any point on this PPF, which will indicate some combination of the two goods. Okay. So, if I add all those combinations, then I will get that line. So, PPA for production possibility frontier is nothing but different combination of the two goods that the economy can produce using that given amount of labor. Right? So, there are certain things we need to remember here. On the, uh, uh, on the graph, find the point that represent 100 computers and 3000 tons of wheat. So, 
So, what are they asking? 100 computers and 3000. Look at this, this is 100 computer and 3000. So, you are here. So, that means look at here what they are asking 100 computer and 3000 wheat. So, probably you will come here. So, that means 3000 and 100 this combination where is it located? It is located within the PPF, below the PPF. Okay, that is why they are asking you to locate. At the same time, if I ask you to locate 4000 tons of wheat and 100 computers, that is locating here. Now, when 4000 tons of wheat and 100 computers is producible, producing 3000 tons of wheat and 100 computers is inefficient. Very simple logic. So, that means any particular point on the PPF is efficient and any particular point below the PPF is inefficient because I still have a chance to increase at least the production of one commodity without reducing the other and that is why any point below the frontier is inefficient. Similarly, if I ask you, can you locate 4500 wheat, tons of wheat and uh, let us say uh, 250 or 170 amount of uh, computer? So, you will be coming here. 4050 means, sorry, for uh, let us say you are producing uh, a point here, which is 250, uh, let us say 250 computer, but 4000 wheat, tons of wheat. Where is this point located? The point is located outside the frontier. So, that means if you want to have 4000 tons of wheat, Producing more than 100 computers is not possible. That is non attainable. That is why any point above the frontier is non attainable. So, that means we understood three things. A point exactly on the frontier is inefficient because you are getting the maximum out of your resources. A point below the frontier is inefficient. Why? Because you can still increase the production of one commodity without reducing the other. Any point above the frontier, outside the frontier is non-attainable. Right? If the economy wants 4000 tons of wheat, only feasible solution for computer is 100. If you want to have more than 100 computers that will take you beyond the frontier, that is not possible. And that is exactly what they are asking you to think. Look at here. So, 100 computers and 300 tons of wheat, level it F. Would it be possible for the economy to produce this combination of the two goods? Why or why not? Okay. So, 100 and 3000 tons of wheat. So, 3000 tons of wheat and 100, it is possible. Okay, 3000 and 100. But it is inefficient. When you have 100 computers, you can actually have 4000, then why to produce only 3000? So, because that point is inside, okay. That way it is possible, but it is an inefficient point. Next, you assume 300 computers and 3500 tons of wheat. So, 3500 tons of wheat, 3500 tons of wheat, it would be here something between 3000 and 3000, 4000 it would be here and 
300 computers. So, when your point is here, let us say this is 3000, this would be here. So, that 3000 to 4000 tons of wheat is associated only 100 computers. You cannot produce 350 because that will take you here, which is outside the frontier, which is non attainable. So, then you can take different combination of the two commodities and see whether that is feasible or not. If feasible, whether it is efficient or inefficient. Both the efficient point and inefficient point are feasible actually, but economy should not produce at a point which is basically uh, inefficient. We should not do that. So, they are explaining here 100 computers and 3000 tons of wheat. Point F, okay. So, point F, 4000 hours of labor possible, but not in, a, a efficient as I told because this is below the uh, PPF. So, they can easily produce more without sacrificing any of the other. Similarly, 300 computers and 3500 tons of wheat is outside the PPF. So, point G basically required 65,000 labor hours and you have only 50,000. So, that means no labor hours is actually left for producing computer and you still need 300 computers. So, no labor hour is uh, left after producing uh, 300, 3500 tons of wheat. That is why point G is non attainable. So, what we know so far from this PPF then? Points on the PPF possible and they are efficient. Points like A, E, all resources are fully utilized. Points under the PPF like F is inefficient, possible but not efficient. Some resources are underutilized. We can produce more of one commodity without reducing any of the other. And then points above the PPF is basically non attainable, not possible because as I told you PPF gives a boundary. Okay. Production possibility frontier gives you a boundary from which you can get different combination of the two goods.